Indiana politicians who made a difference during the Holocaust. Today's program will be about Governor Paul V. McNutt. Um, my name is Mike Brown. I'm the executive director of the Indiana Jewish Historical Society. We collect and preserve and interpret Indiana's Jewish past. Today's guest lecture is Professor Dean Kotlowski, who is professor of history at Salisbury University. A specialist in 20th century US political history, he received his PhD and MA from Indiana University and is, and is author of Paul V. McNutt and the Age of FDR. I wanna thank our partners at Candles Holocaust Museum and Education Center and the Indianapolis Jewish Community Relations Council for helping us make this program possible today. And all the generous supporters like yourself who try to interpret and preserve Indiana's Jewish history. Um, if you enjoy our programming, please consider making a donation or becoming a member. Uh, please ask questions in the chat and we'll answer them towards the end of the program. And if you will, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Dean Kotlowski. Thank you. And let's give him a warm Hoosier welcome. Mike, thank you very much. It's an honor to be able to present the keynote lecture in this series in 2021. Very important work that the Indiana Jewish Historical Society is doing. And a shout out also to Candles in Terre Haute, where I've given talks before and the wonderful work that they do. We are going to talk about a figure who's very important in the history of the Holocaust, in US political history, and also in Indiana's political history, all of these themes and more coming together. So just as a little bit of an introduction, between 1939, excuse me, between 1937 and 1939, approximately 1,300 German and Austrian Jews fled Nazi Germany and arrived safely in Manila where they resettled. Um, at a time when much of the world closed its borders to Jewish refugees, the Philippines provided a haven or an open door to them, at least for a while. And an overview of their story can be found in this film called An Open Door. Um, I will share the link with Mike and the Society and with Candles and folks can um, look at this 14 minute version of what's gonna be a much longer film a little later on. Uh, there is also a documentary film called uh, Rescue in the Philippines, Refuge from the Holocaust. And again, I can share links with that as well. So uh, the key actors in the Philippine rescue venture were the Jewish community in Manila led by the four Frieder brothers, the Philippine government led by President Manuel Quezon, and most importantly, the top US official in the Philippines, which was still um, a US territory, and that was US High Commissioner and former Indiana Governor, Paul Voorhees McNutt. And uh, this has become a somewhat big story. Uh, commemorative stamps were issued by the Philippines and Israel in 2015. Uh, joint issue by both countries. This is a souvenir sheet for those of you that like me are stamp collectors or maybe are not stamp collectors. And you can see here, um, here's President Kazan and the flags of these two countries. And I, I guess if, if, if I have anything I wanna point out, you don't see McNutt here. And yet I would argue that he was really the instrumental force behind this refugee project. So who was Paul V. McNutt? Well, on one level, he was a very, very handsome man. And people commented on that over and over again in the political realm, in the journalistic realm, in Indiana and nationally. As he moved from into the governor's office in Indianapolis, and then increasingly looked to the White House as a Democrat, he wanted to succeed Franklin Roosevelt in 1940 thinking Roosevelt would not run for a third term. So this is a portrait by the great Filipino portrait artist, Fernando Armasolo. McNutt sought, uh, he sat for this portrait 
while he was high commissioner in Manila. And um, uh, you can see how handsome he was. The press noted his good looks. They were not tremendously common back then for politicians. The press also noted that he was a man of unusual, unusual and obvious ambition. In fact, I think his obviousness in his ambition what, what was, was what was so unusual. Politicians are all ambitious, but the degree to which they show it uh, can vary. And this is a bust of Paul V. McNutt at the Indiana Memorial Union in Indianapolis. And um, the plaque here lists his various accomplishments and offices. Some are related to IU um, and some are not, but you will see here that he was national commander of the American Legion, governor of Indiana. Well, the students at IU, the story goes, used to joke that there was enough space down below governor of Indiana uh, for the words president of the United States. It never happened, uh, but not for want of trying. Uh, this cartoon, which appeared in the Washington Post, shows you the various offices that McNutt held as he seemingly was ascending uh, to his destiny, which was the White House. He was a very good public speaker, um, a person of charisma, at least some charisma, but you notice here what he's doing is he seems to be building a resume based on varied experience. So maybe he's a little bit of a combination of John F. Kennedy with the looks, the speaking ability, and uh, George H.W. Bush in terms of compiling a number of very different offices that he held. This is an image of McNutt at the 1940 Democratic Convention. Of course, it didn't happen for him for president. FDR was renominated a third time, and it didn't happen for him as vice president. And he was willing to be put forward. He was willing, he was seeking the vice presidency. And FDR chose Secretary of Agriculture Henry Wallace. And what McNutt did was to very graciously bow out, even though the story is he had enough support at the convention to be nominated for vice president if he had pushed it. He would not do that. And the image here on the right is of McNutt speaking to the delegates announcing that he was pulling out of any consideration for vice president. He said, uh, he is my commander in chief, meaning Roosevelt. I am a loyal soldier and I will do essentially what I am told. So you wanna kind of keep that in mind. Another aspect of McNutt, very liberal governor of Indiana, uh, got the Hoosier state hooked into the federal social security system, welcomed FDR's work relief programs, passed labor legislation, but uh, 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 as this image suggests, he also used National Guard troops to restore order in a few instances in Indiana in strike-torn communities such as Terre Haute. And this rather left-leaning labor outfit, the Workers Defense League, tagged McNutt for the use of those troops. They called him the Hoosier Hitler. And it's interesting how our perspective changes because now you could say he's a Hoosier Oscar Schindler, perhaps. This contrast is really, really interesting. Uh, after serving one term as governor of Indiana, he could not succeed himself as governors of Indiana can do today. Governors can run for reelection immediately. Um, they don't have to wait four years, but back then you did. So after a term, McNutt was out of office. He hoped to get a position in FDR's cabinet. Uh, Roosevelt gave him an appointment, but it was to become high commissioner to the Philippines. In part, to get this ambitious young man, uh, this guy from Indiana, out of the country. And the idea was, you know, he would be maybe in a kind of political exile in, in, uh, in, in the Philippines. Maybe he wouldn't do a very good job over there and he would just sort of die out in terms of his political prospects. The opposite happened. McNutt turned out to do quite a very good job there and his presidential prospects and his status in terms of his presidential timber as this cartoon is indicating seemed to grow when he was in the Philippines. 
um, he would seem on the surface to be a kind of unlikely Oscar Schindler, because if you think about the history of Indiana in the 1920s, you have racial tension, you have the lynching in Marion, you have ethnic tension, you have nativism, you have, as Thomas Hart Benton shows us in this famous mural from the history of Indiana at Indiana University, you have the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, which essentially takes over the state government. And this is a controversial portrait on a number of levels or, or controversial mural on a number of levels, but you can see uh, the Ku Klux Klan meeting in the center here and you see a fiery cross um, denoting Indiana's troubled history. Uh, so when I was writing my biography of McNutt and I knew this larger context, I knew what McNutt was gonna do with Jewish refugees. I was looking for links that would allow us to understand why did he do what he did, which was so exceptional in helping these refugees. And I think he, he, it starts out with him being something of an outsider. He was born in Franklin, Indiana in, 19, in 1891. Uh, his father was a minor state official and worked for a time in Indianapolis. The family moved to Martinsville, but they were not you know, a part of Martinsville. They were outsiders. And uh, one of the consequences was Paul McNutt was bullied by his schoolmates working class youths who um, uh, gave him a tough time after school. And if I were to engage in a little bit of psychology here and maybe even psychohistory, I think it gave McNutt a sense of toughness and you can sort of see him as he, as a young man there looking like a tough guy holding a football, but also some degree of sympathy for people who suffered persecution. The family had connections with the Masonic order that had experienced its share of discrimination and intolerance over European and American history. Uh, he's also a very well-educated man. Now education doesn't make you sensitive to diversity all the time, right? Um, but I, I think it helped to broaden his horizons. So he graduates with a BA from Indiana University when few people had university education. And he got his LLB from Harvard Law School, which of course has a royal reputation in the annals of American legal education. Uh, his Democratic Party had its racist intolerant wing to be sure, but it was also the home of immigrants and more welcoming of more newer immigrants and Catholics and Jews than the Republican Party was. So um, politically, uh, Jews are gonna be part of his political coalition. He serves as a soldier and an officer in World War I, although not in Europe, uh, but still he joined the American Legion after the war, the largest veterans organization to emerge from World War I. He becomes Indiana commander of the Legion and then national commander of the American Legion. And the Legion had segregated posts. But what's key to remember for McNutt and this story is the American Legion was open to all veterans, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion. And McNutt worked to keep it that way. And I think that that's very, very important. Um, so when we look at McNutt and we look at his governorship, becomes governor in 1933, he's elected 1932. He forms strong partnerships with Jewish leaders, including Senator Jacob Weiss of Indianapolis. And this part of the story becomes important a little later on. So he is inaugurated on January 9th, 1933. Hitler is appointed chancellor of Germany three weeks later and uh, Roosevelt becomes uh, president, is inaugurated on March 4th. So it's in roughly a few months of each other, these three men come to power and McNutt is able to read and be influenced by reports of Nazi atrocities against Jews in Germany, especially in the Indianapolis Times. 
Uh, and what McNutt did was to advertise or amplify his opposition to Nazism in 1933 by doing something that governors of Indiana are not expected to do. And that is go to Chicago, where there was one of the first rallies against Nazi treatment of Jews. And there McNutt attacked this policy of persecution, saying that no government can long endure that fails to guarantee to its people the right to live as a normal human being. The present government of Germany thus writes its own destruction. And I think in terms of McNutt's political ideology, existing as a quote unquote normal human being meant enjoying a degree of safety or security in your own bodily and physical and mental well being. And security was one of his favorite words. Having this sense of safety from persecution, as well as from poverty or privation. So when you look at McNutt's various motivations here, as we continue with the story of why would he have helped Jewish refugees, you see the political, right? He has Jewish allies, but the political also works in another way. He knows that there's anti-Semitism in Indiana and the United States writ large. He knows that intolerance is there, so he has to be careful. And as a politician, he was, and you're gonna see a little bit of that. Uh, practically, he knows that when he holds government office, he is there to do the work for the people and to provide some degree of security during, of course, the Great Depression. And then, of course, there is principle. Um, McNutt did absorb what he was taught about America being the land of the free and being open to different groups and having religious freedom and you will see that in his speeches as well. A picture of that rally in Chicago. Well, how did Paul V. McNutt help Jews come to the Philippines between 1937 and 1939? Um, he had to overcome obstacles. US immigration law and policy based on restrictive quotas. Bureaucratic and inertia and anti-Semitism at the Department of State. A president who was at best intermittently interested in these issues and not strongly committed to helping refugees. And then there was something called the likely to become a public charge provision of the Immigration Act of 1917. So what was this? This was one of the first laws to restrict European immigration to the United States. And it said that you were not going to be admitted to the United States if you were unable to find a job, if you were likely, in other words, to uh, become unemployed uh, and would have to go on the public purse. Uh, what people in the late 20th century would have said, going on welfare, right? And when this was originally written, the intention was to exclude people who were essentially disabled in some way or, or another. By the 1930s, policymakers in Washington were reading the stipulation a little differently. They said you were likely to become a public charge if you had no job prospects in the United States, even if you were quote unquote able to work. And so, um, a lot of people would have been unlikely to find a job because it was the depression. So this was a even more stringent way of keeping people out. Scholarly criticism of US policy has been manifest. Uh, David Wyman, for example, has written that what essentially the US government was doing was piling up official orders, rules, impediments, piling them high, almost making them what he called paper walls to keep people out. And David Wyman has also uh, appealed for more attention to what he calls the illusionary search for havens for Jews. And there weren't that many, but one did emerge in, uh, in the Western hemisphere in the Dominican Republic, where about 860 Jews were resettled in what was a US uh, client state. Why did the Philippines become a haven? 
Well, uh, the Philippines was in a state of transition. It was moving from being a US colony to an independent country, which would happen in 1946. And so starting in 1935, the Philippines became a commonwealth with the power to elect its own president, run its own internal affairs, and yet still be under the US flag and US sovereignty until 1946. And in this period of the Commonwealth, 35 to 46, 1935 to 1946, the US ran the Philippines foreign and uh, military policy. And America was represented in Manila by a super diplomat called the High Commissioner. Before 1935, the US appointed the Governor General and the Governor General was the executive in the islands, okay? But now um, uh, it, it's gonna be the High Commissioner and people were wondering how this was gonna actually operate. The relationship between the US High Commissioner and this Philippine president who was Manuel Quezon. Immigration policy in the Philippines was also nebulous. The Philippines did not have its own immigration laws. It was under some US immigration law and not under others in terms of admitting people into the islands. Uh, and the US over the course of its history in the Philippines starting in 1898, when America acquired the islands from Spain, the United States had allowed Chinese immigrants to come into the Philippines and then Japanese immigrants because US policymakers were thinking it was better to have these immigrants um, come to the Philippines rather than the United States. And there was resentment in the Philippines of these groups coming in by the Filipinos. Uh, US uh, immigration law such as it was in the Philippines was very lax and inefficient in its enforcement. McNutt called the immigration service corrupt and President Quezon, who again, the first elected president of the Philippines, who comes into office in 1935, uh, he dismisses the immigration service as a damn mess. And overall, though, uh, the McNutt Quezon relationship ran very smoothly. And with a few bumps at the beginning, notwithstanding, there was a good deal of agreement and warmth. And what you see here is McNutt on the right and Kazan on the left sharing a joke and McNutt writing here, ours has been a most happy association based on confidence and understanding. May our sense of humor grow and last as has our friendship with affectionate regards and every good wish, Paul V. McNutt. These were two men who liked to drink smoke cigars, play poker. They were veteran politicians who were interested in getting things done, in cutting deals, and not engaging in posturing and sermonizing to each other. So the making of a haven in the, in the Philippines, it starts in 1937 when the Japanese invade China and advance on Shanghai. There are 28 German Jewish families in Shanghai and they flee before the Japanese arrive and they are able to make it to Manila, actually aboard a German ship. Um, McNutt, for his part, waived visa requirements. That was one of his few powers as high commissioner. 40 families enter Manila in the summer and the fall of 1937. Now, I think what's very, very important here is that McNutt becomes an agent here of a much larger venture. A few months later, in the very early part of 1938, in February 1938, he returns to the United States to check in with his political associates on his emerging presidential campaign. He meets with them. He meets and gives a report to Roosevelt about the Philippines. And he meets with the leader of the Refugee Economic Corporation in New York, an organization committed to Jewish resettlement. 
That man's name is Julius Weiss. Well, what is the award-winning gossip here? Who was Julius Weiss? He was the brother of Jacob Weiss, the state senator from Indiana, who was McNutt's political ally. So Weiss tells him about a plan to resettle more than 100 families in the Philippines. And McNutt says, OK, as long as these refugees are able to support themselves in compliance with US immigration law, and in particular, the likely to become a public charge stipulation. So what McNutt does is to enlist Manila's Jewish community. It was a small community. Uh, Jews started to arrive in the Philippines during the Spanish period. And there's a small grouping uh, they are a small community in Manila. He turns to them, and in particular, the American cigar manufacturer, Philip Frieder, and his brothers, Alex Morris and Herbert. They also were Midwesterners. They were from Cincinnati. As I said, they had a lucrative cigar manufacturing business in Manila. And McNutt got to know them. Kazan got to know them. And McNutt reached out and said, you guys run this refugee venture. And what the Freeders did was to compile a list of 14 categories of occupations and needed skills, as well as the number of Jews to be admitted in each category. And again, they would come from Germany. And the idea was that these Jews would have skills and would be able to contribute to the Jewish community in terms of its social cohesion uh, and even its prosperity. And they would obviously be able to find jobs. So what kinds of skills and occupations are we looking at here? There were doctors and dentists, mechanics, I think accountants as well, um, other skills. They needed a rabbi. So on the list, it said, we want one rabbi under the age of 40 married. So what you see here is the idea of immigration broadly construed being a help to a new community. And I think that that's very, very important in terms of the vision. And you see also the vision here is McNutt is using laws that were designed to restrict immigration to actually bring Jewish professionals, Jews of certain needed skills out of Nazi Germany and into the Philippines. And he impressed over and over again that we need the right refugees making it to Manila. People who again will contribute to the community, will find gainful employment. Um, and he said, if, if this works, we can then admit more. So he left it with the Jewish Refugee Committee in Manila. I'm not gonna go through the whole process as to how they got there. But it is interesting that had McNutt accepted less stringent enforcement of this likely to become a public charge provision, he might have admitted more Jews, but he would have risked interference from the Department of State who might've said, what are you doing out there? And what are you up to? And things along those lines. What are these? These are McNutt's poker chips with his monogram on them. They come to me in terms of this image from descendants of the Frieder family. And these descendants say that McNutt, Kazan, and the Frieder brothers played poker. Apparently they did. And while they played poker, they discussed the Jewish refugee venture, which perhaps they did. I think they may have mentioned it. Um, there are some accounts that suggest they did the planning of this or were in serious negotiations about the planning. I'm not so sure I believe that, but it is an interesting connection between these men and very important. Um, I'm gonna show you this map here. Uh, this is a map of the Philippines. And at the very bottom here in the sort of turquoise color, I guess you would say, is the island of Mindanao. Um, it had a sizable Muslim population Kazan was a little worried about that. And he was also worried that 
Japanese immigrants who were getting a toehold in Mindanao. And with those concerns there, um, plans were developed starting in the very late 1930s to resettle a much larger group of German and Austrian Jews on again, the southernmost island of Mindanao. It was called the Mindanao Plan. And you know your history in 1938, a difficult year, the Union or Anschluss between Germany and Austria, Kristallnacht in November, and a worsening refugee crisis. When the Germans occupied Austria, they inherited, for, I guess from their point of view, the, um, or they acquired a country with a sizable Jewish population in Vienna, which of course uh, they persecuted mercilessly and immediately. Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, um, horrible official pogrom uh, against Jewish synagogues or Jewish businesses and synagogues and a worsening refugee crisis because Jews really wanna get out of now this enlarged Germany. And uh, uh, it was in late 1938 that the State Department started to say, this is one of those periods where they start to think refugees, this is an important issue, we should do something. And they reach out to the Philippines and McNutt and his colleagues come up with a plan to resettle 10,000 refugees on that island of Mindanao over 10 years, 10,000 Jewish refugees over 10 years. It's called the Mindanao Plan. There was a rally to protest Kristallnacht and McNutt spoke and you can see his words here. Um, this is McNutt condemning Kristallnacht within The past few months, we have seen the reign of law replaced by the sanctification of force. The threat of war adopted as an instrument of national policy. Humble men and women denied the freedom to think their own thoughts and to worship God according to their own conscience. And the dispersion all over the world of millions of helpless wanderers with no place to lay their heads. Well, of course, having a place to lay your head having a refuge or a haven was one tangible and specific um, form of security. Kazan was supportive at first. He hated the Nazis. He gave part of his own uh, land to the Manila Jewish refugees and they built a place called Marikina Hall. So Kazan was very supportive, but he was also a politician. And a number of Filipinos started to get anxious. They hadn't liked the Chinese immigrants. They were worried that these newfound Japanese immigrants or these newly arrived Japanese immigrants were taking over their country. That was their perception. And they were welcoming of the Jewish refugees, but they also thought, well, do we really wanna do this? And there was criticism in the press and there was a, newspaper editorial in one of the papers in Manila that said, it, you know, it should be Phil the Philippines for Filipinos. It's a case of charity beginning at home. That's a rough quotation of what was said. Uh, Kazan initially had thought this was a great idea. We'll get these European settlers, these Jews with great skills, and we will resettle them and they will enhance the larger country. But again, when the, you start to see resistance, you start to see vacillation. And then McNutt leaves the Philippines to launch his presidential campaign and to take over the newly established Federal Security Agency. That happens in 1939. His replacement, Francis Sayer, was Woodrow Wilson's son-in-law, um, a man of a kind of elite background uh, I guess the most generous thing you could say about him is that he, uh, in terms of his views, is, is that he didn't regard the Mindanao plan as practical. And some people have said on a less generous nature and probably more accurate that he harbored a lot of the, the, the standard anti-Semitic views that uh, officials in the State Department had, or at least that kind of insensitivity to the plight of Jewish refugees. 
So Sayer indicated his opposition to the Mindanao plan and he essentially said that uh, it was impractical. You would hear that over and over again because you had to resettle these settlers, not in a city, but in a rural area. So influenced by that, Kazan, who was a real wily political operator, actually signed restrictive immigration legislation. And under this legislation signed in 1940, there were enough loopholes that would have allowed the Mindanao plan to go forward. But I don't think his will was there as it was before under McNaught. And the onset of World War II in Europe in 1939 meant it was extraordinarily difficult to get Jews out of Europe. And that fact, unfortunately, um, uh, ended the prospects of the Mindanao plan. Terms of reflections, I think Frank Ephraim, the late Frank Ephraim, one of these Jewish refugees as a young boy and the author of a history memoir called Escape to Manila put it very well. Between the leadership of the Frieder brothers and McNaught, Jewish lives were being saved. That was the reality. 1300 made it to Manila. They survived the Japanese occupation. And many of these so-called Manila Jews or Manilaners made it to the United States after World War II. In 2005, a handful of them gathered in Cincinnati to remember, to reminisce, reflect, and express their gratitude. And among those honored was Paul V. McNutt, the former governor of Indiana, and for good reason. Because American history is populated with many would-be presidents and would-be presidential nominees. This all comes from my own personal collection of political buttons. All of these are of men who sought their party's nomination and did not get it, their party's nomination for president. And you might say, well, I thought Mitt Romney was nominated by the Republicans. No, that's a button. Um, I'm a Romney volunteer of his father, George Romney, who sought the Republican nomination in 1968 and of course did not get it. So you have a lot of these political figures. One of them is Paul V. McNutt. And the prevailing wind in 1940 was in favor of a third term for Roosevelt and it blew away McNutt's prospects for the presidency that year. And FDR had the power to pick a replacement in 1940 for Vice President John Nance Garner, his first vice president, or according to this cartoon, his first wife. So he selected Henry Wallace, his second wife, if you will, according to this cartoonist. And then in 1944, he got a new vice president or a new wife, Harry Truman. And you can see reaching for the bouquet here is Paul McNutt and the cartoonist Jim Berryman of the Washington Star refers to McNutt below as my favorite bridesmaid. So a lot of these wannabe presidents and wannabe presidential nominees and vice presidential nominees, but relatively few people acted to save Jews during the 1930s and 1940s. And of course, uh, you had Raoul Wallenberg and Oscar Schindler. And I also would argue you have Paul V. McNutt. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Dr. Kudlowski, for uh, speaking to us today. And now I have a few different questions that we have in the chat uh, down below. Um, the first one um, is from Jill Y. Simmons. Uh, was McNutt's ability to waive visa requirements something all U.S. ambassadors had, or was it unique to the Philippines because of its lax immigration policy? Um, it was unique to the Philippines because those were instructions that were given specifically to the High Commissioner. And uh, additionally, uh, Jill Y. Simmons also asked, did McNutt himself ever reflect or comment on the failure of the Mindanao plan or the success of rescuing uh, 1,300 who made it to Manila? He did not, to my knowledge. Um, 
in a formal way. He did not write a memoir. There is no oral history with him. His, uh, his papers are a little bit scattered. They're mainly official. Um, we do see some hints. At the very end of the war, he made a speech to a Jewish group in Miami in 1945 uh, after some of the, the, uh, the film of the extermination camps was released. And he very, very strongly denounced, um, I can't remember, the factories of death that the Germans had perpetrated. And he did make a mention there of a brief mention of his efforts. And um, as he was beginning to prepare to run for president in 1940, in a very targeted way, uh, some of his campaign staff let this know what he had done uh, to Jewish audiences. But the presidential campaign was, uh, it wasn't really, it didn't turn out to be fully formed, right? Because FDR never said he was going to run or he never said he wasn't going to run. Um, it it, 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 it might have been a dynamic like Trump and Pence in a way. Um, if Trump was going to run and Pence was going to run in 2024 and Trump didn't tell anyone, um, it would keep Pence in a state of limbo and the other candidates. And that's what Roosevelt did to, uh, to McNutt and so on and so forth. But you can see little hints there that they were willing to get the story out um, to, uh, to certain audiences. And there is uh, an untitled narrative of what McNutt had done in the Philippines. And there is a brief discussion of, of that here, but he doesn't do any major retrospective. He doesn't comment to my knowledge at all on, uh, on what he did and maybe if he could have saved more people. Um, and then we have another question from Lindy Mintz who asked, did McNutt keep a journal or write more personal reflective uh, in a more personal reflective manner about his role during World War II in the Philippines? Was he asked to speak about it after the war? Was his service in saving Jews recognized quickly or not until later? It was not recognized until much later. Um, it really started to become better known because of Frank Ephraim's book and that event that I mentioned in Cincinnati. Um, it is interesting today, and I'd be interested to hear what your commentators and, and people with the society would say about this. But my understanding is that after the war, I think uh, Elie Wiesel put it this way, the first generation, I don't think this is just of Jews, but of, of, of you know, Americans and people around the world, they didn't really wanna talk about this as much as we talk about it today with Holocaust education and so on and so forth. Um, we didn't have the kind of films that we have and, um, and uh, uh, that kind of attention in various different cultural venues and documentary history venues and things along those lines um, for a variety of reasons. That starts to change in the 1960s. And then in the 1970s, when you have the, the uh, TV docu-drama Holocaust, you get the legislation that establishes the, the Holocaust, the National Holocaust Memorial Museum, and you get Schindler's List in the early 1990s and so on and so forth. So, you know, McNutt dies in 1955. He's somebody who, again, never becomes president, never nominated for president, holds a lot of high offices, but something of a secondary or a second tier figure in the sense that he's not president or vice president. He's still very important, right? But this is what happens. Uh, we forget about these figures. He only had one child, a daughter. So he doesn't have a long line of descendants who are gonna keep the flame alive. He's a Democrat in what becomes a largely Republican state. And so he himself is increasingly forgotten. Some of his major acts as governor and other aspects of his career are forgotten. And this particular act was also forgotten. And he at the time, I, I said he, 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 select, he selectively played it up. He didn't wanna make this a big issue and brag about it because he knew there might be a reaction against it, okay? So he wanted, again, to move in a way that was politically feasible, would not excite anti-Semitic, xenophobic sentiments in the larger country, and still help as much as he could in his own way. He's balancing a lot of things. And I think part of that balancing is why the, the story 
was not as well known. I think it begins to some extent with him. Do you really feel that a, a lesser politician could have carried this out? Well, I, I don't know what you mean by a lesser politician. Um, Someone who oh, oh, isn't oh, able oh. to work in as many right. different orbits and isn't right. able to be as nuanced as he is. Do you think that someone who was who is less pragmatic would be able to to make this rescue or 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 to convince as many people as he did? I, I think that um, I, I think his political background and those kinds of political skills and the political values that he brought to this were enormously uh, important and enormously helpful. And again, I, I think somebody who was he was a conventional thinker in certain ways, but here. Um, not so much. Here it was a heavily practical politician who was willing to take the powers that he had and apply them. We haven't talked at all about McNutt's uh, governorship in terms of how he, in some ways, uh, tested the limits of gubernatorial and executive power. And he was a very strong governor. People called him a dictator. Uh, and so that willingness to take power and to use it in that sense a lesser politician, a lesser power broker, probably would not have done what he had done. And then I have one more question. Um, is McNutt, to the best of your knowledge, uh, part of the avenue of the righteous in Jerusalem for saving lives in his position? He was nominated to be a righteous among nations by Frank Ephraim, but he did not get it. It's an excellent question. So he's not in the same league as Raoul Wallenberg and Oscar Schindler, my understanding is that you have to meet a higher threshold, okay? You actually would have had to put yourself at risk and you had to be in Europe during the war. I think both of those were one of the two and that was not a case with McNutt. So he has not been recognized in that way. Um, but um, uh, but uh, recognition has been coming his way with these documentary films. And I don't know if I mentioned this earlier in the talk, but there is a Filipino film called Kazan's Game, which really plays up the poker playing aspect of all of this. And there actually is an American actor who plays Paul McNutt in that. But um, this is again, how things are, are how, how history becomes memory and things get remembered and forgotten. That film and the documentary film Rescue in the Philippines promote the idea that Dwight Eisenhower played and it played a role in this. And we all remember Dwight Eisenhower and uh, he did not play a role in this that we can discern. But it's easier to remember an American national hero and a president and to think he might've played a role in this than somebody who never made it to the White House and is largely forgotten and people asking the question Paul McNutt, who? Um, now we're doing a, a three-part series with three different Hoosiers who made a, a difference during the Holocaust, three different uh, Hoosier politicians. And um, I, I asked you about McDonald a little bit earlier um, and he didn't have any direct connections, but did uh, Benjamin Victor Cohen and the uh, Franklin and, and Roosevelt's administration, did they have any connections at all? politically? Uh, not, not very many um, the, that I could discern. Uh, Benjamin Cohen was very loyal to Roosevelt and he was very much a promoter of the idea of a third term that would have been inimical to McNutt's political prospects. And um, he and Tommy Corcoran were kind of like a, a pair in the White House and Cohen did a lot of the drafting of legislation and things like that. Uh, I think Corcoran did um, did what the Nixon administration people would have called dirty tricks. At least that he had that reputation, and um, I, I just did not see a lot of connection between Cohen and uh, and McNutt. It's it's interesting how you know someone who seemed to be so far outside of Roosevelt's inner circle was, in essence, able to make even a perhaps a bigger difference numerically and in his ability to 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 rescue Jews and, and and from you know do you I mean do you believe that Kazan himself would have pursued a similar policy path without 
uh, McNutt being there with him, or do you think that Kazon would not have done that without McNutt? My gut impression would be that McNutt was crucial and critical here. So if you're going to imagine an alternative set of circumstances, I think you'd have to imagine a high commissioner who had at least as much sensitivity on the part of, you know, toward Jews and, and refugees and victims of persecution, um, replacing McNutt or being there in McNutt's stead and having to influence Kazan. I, I just, I, I just don't know. Um, Kazan did have a visceral hatred of Nazism. Um, he, uh, you know, even though the Philippines, you know, was under U.S. sovereignty and America ran, quote unquote, the Philippine foreign policy, Kazan was testing the limits of that. And he made a trip to Mexico and he made a trip to Germany. And his grandson, who did not know his grandfather firsthand, but tells the story that when they saw in Germany the stormtroopers marching in formation, Kazan and his wife just shook. And they did form, Kazan did form um, personal relationships with leaders in the Jewish community. Again, this is according to the Frieder family, because Jews had been victims of discrimination, as had Filipinos, right? Because they were subjugated to American colonial power. So that kind of bond. So perhaps um, without McNutt, you would have had you would have had a bond and a, an adventure between Kazan and the Frieder brothers, but whoever was the high commissioner would have had to have been supportive, at minimally tacitly supportive. And McNutt had to talk to the State Department and say, look, if this is what we are doing, this is why, because the State Department would say, well, what's going on over there? And McNutt, who had a background in law, could say, well, this is you know, in compliance with the law. We are only admitting a certain number we're behaving responsibly was the message. And I think it was not just his political background, but his legal background that helped. Um, does, does anyone have any other uh, final questions uh, to pose in the chat? Okay. Um, we just have a lot of thank yous to Dr. Kotlowski, uh, a lot of people who loved your book. And we'd like to thank you for coming here to the IJHS. Uh, we'd like to thank Candles and the JCRC. Um, and it was so important uh, to have your talk today, uh, considering everything that's going on in the world. Uh, a lot of uh, policies about immigration still going on to this day and, and conversations that seem very relevant in a lot of different ways to, uh, to, to folks here. So, um, Dr. Kotlowski, uh, we really, really thank you for coming today and, and speaking with us. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and would you like to share anything else, any other uh, final thoughts that you have? Uh, thank you, Mike, I, I would. It's interesting that we are talking a little bit about presidential politics on the day before this country inaugurates a new president. And it allows us to think about Franklin Roosevelt, um, a president who was inaugurated four times and on whose watch the inauguration day was shifted from March 4th to January 20th. And about a political leader, again, from Indiana, sadly largely forgotten, who was never inaugurated as president uh, and yet wanted to be, but made important contributions in this area regarding the Holocaust and in other areas as well. So I thank you very much for this opportunity to once again uh, discuss the life of Paul B. McDonald and his contributions. Thank you again, Dr. Kotlowski. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And uh, please look forward to uh, seeing you at our, at our next program uh, next month, uh, where we will be uh, talking about other Hoosier politicians who made a difference during the Holocaust. Thank you and have a great day. Be well, all the best, bye-bye.